So we're looking at um, our expectation today. We're going to continue in Acts chapter 3 as we have been. This is kind of our golden text for what we've been looking at. And when it comes to your leadership, obviously, we take these moments before our services on Sunday um, for progress in leadership. Um, But you have to decide what kind of leader you want to be. Um, We are very specific in this house. This is a faith church. This is a word church. And so all that you hear as it pertains to leadership is gonna lean in that direction. And so there's a lot of things that you can do. There's a lot of things that you can glean from. There's a lot of places where you can find um, teaching, uh, you know, as it pertains to being a person of influence. But everything here is gonna be filtered through the message of faith. And it's gonna be filtered through the the, the word-based, um, you know, that's our, that's our affiliation. That's where we're coming from. And so that's the, and you're going to have to decide, um, every time you hear the word of God, if you're going to live that way, uh, just coming to church at a certain place doesn't mean that you've bought in. There's a lot of reasons why people assemble themselves in the places that they assemble themselves. And so I don't want you to deceive yourself into thinking that, you know, just showing up, being a part, gosh, not even just being on staff. That, that, doesn't, that doesn't cut it. So let's look at Acts chapter three. It says, one day at three o'clock in the afternoon, Peter and John were on their way to the temple for a prayer meeting. At the same time, there was a man crippled from birth being carried up. Every day he sat down at the temple gate, the one called beautiful to beg from those going into the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to enter the temple, he asked for a handout. Peter with John at his side, looked him straight in the eye and said, look here. He looked up expecting to get something from them. And we'll stop right there. If you'll write this statement down from last week, our perspective is influenced by expectation. Our perspective is influenced by expectation, but our circumstances are influenced by action. So our perspective is influenced by expectation, but our circumstances are influenced by action. So if from the inside, I expect to be affected by the coronavirus, then I'm gonna stock up on toilet paper. I'm gonna stock up on paper towel. I think our Walmart is out of hand sanitizer and they're out of masks, right? If that's how, that's for real. If, and Albertsons has a limit now on paper towel and toilet paper. You can only buy two at a time, which I didn't really understand that. But I guess like if things get really bad, people aren't going to leave their house. And so they're stocking up on those things. But if my, inter- my in- you're moving your life in the direction of this internal picture which is how you look at life, your perspective. James two verse 17 says, faith without works is dead. And so we know there's an action to that as well. Remember we said, when he is your expectation, you believe that in him is all that you need. So when he is your expectation, you believe that in him is all that you need. And so we were looking at what we had access to in him, and you can just write these things down um, just to review Galatians 3, 13 through 14. We know that we've been blessed. We have a blessing, but it's our job to work with that blessing. Philippians chapter two, verse 12, we have to work with it where we would exist in a church world that would really want everything kind of spoon fed to us It's already worked out like you tell me what to do, so to speak. Um, uh, We also have all of all of the promises. Second Peter chapter one, um, verse three, and then um, second Corinthians one, two. All the promises and everything that pertains to life and godliness. So we have all the promises and all things. These all have to be worked with though. And so when we're looking at working with the blessing and we started talking about that a little bit last week and the fact that fear and a life of works will keep you from operating in the blessing. And if you read Galatians chapter three, and I encourage you to do that um, over the next couple of weeks as we're in this study, you really see the conflict um, in in Galatians chapter three. And, and we can phrase it this way, Um, today, it's really natural. 
natural versus spirit. That's kind of how how it kind of unfolded in our in our in our lesson today. It's it's really a struggle between doing things naturally and doing things by the spirit. And so as we look at that, we we um, will will know this, and you can write this down. We'll kind of build from here today. Looking after things naturally. Looking after things naturally will prevent progress. Looking after things naturally will prevent progress in and with this unseen force called the blessing. So looking after things naturally will prevent progress in and with this unseen force called the blessing. And so let's look at um, some natural things. In James chapter three, verse 16 and 17, I'm gonna be reading these next few um, sections of verses from the Living Bible. James chapter three, verse 16 and 17 says, where there is jealousy or selfish ambition, there will be disorder and every other kind of evil. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, full of quiet gentleness, then it is peace loving and courteous. It allows discussion and is willing to yield to others. It is full of mercy and good deeds. It is wholehearted, straightforward and sincere. So strife is natural. Strife is natural. You can't make progress in the blessing. You can't have this this working this out when you've got strife in your heart. Strife is natural. It will prevent you from making progress in the blessing. In Mark chapter six, verse one through four, Soon afterwards, he left that section of the country and returned with his disciples to Nazareth, his hometown. The next Sabbath, he went to the synagogue to teach and the people were astonished at his wisdom and his miracles because he was just a local man like themselves. He's no better than we are, they said. He's just a carpenter, Mary's boy, and a brother of James and Joseph, Judas and Simon. And his sisters live right here among us. They were offended. And then Jesus told him, a prophet is honored everywhere, except in his hometown and among his relatives and by his own family. So familiarity is natural. Familiarity is natural. You have to defend against these things if you're gonna make progress in the blessing. They, they said things like, he's just a local man like themselves. You know, there are certain people in your life who should not be treated or positioned like everyone else in your life. And if you don't defend against that, you know, I was, um, Greg and I were on a date on Friday night. We were out and we were, um, there was a couple, two couples sitting next to us. They were older, not as old as my parents, but um, they, yeah, not even close, but their friends came over to talk to them. And, and so they start talking about their surgeries and all their ailments and uh, the, the president. And, and I, I honestly, I thought, I thought this couple was never going to leave because the four of them are sitting there. But then this other couple came over to them. They had already been out at least once, um, with their wine and their cigarettes for a smoke break and coming back. And so the, the three men are talking while the wives had excused themselves for a smoke and, and a wine break and and the thought occurred to me and I told I told Greg I said you know what I'm thinking right now and he said no I said I'm thinking that if it weren't for Charles Neiman that would be my parents that would be my parents and that would be your parents if not for that man and then we started imagining where we would be, but, but what we didn't realize until we'd got into it is there, would, there was no way that we were together. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> he started, and I was like, oh, there's no way where this story goes, where we end up together, if not for that, for that one man. My parents would, would, would be living like a, a natural life without the light that they have. Familiarity is natural. There are certain people in your life that are not, I mean, literally, they are not like anybody else. They are not like anybody else. John chapter six, 53 through 56. And, and you can actually just in your notes, we're gonna kind of skip around for the sake of time, but, but we're going straight through 69 
give or take. So for your notes, if you just want to write John 6, 53 through 69, this is familiar to you guys. We've looked at it so many times. So Jesus said it again, with all the earnestness I possess, I tell you this, unless you eat the flesh of the Messiah and drink his blood, you cannot have eternal life within you. But anyone who does not eat my flesh and drink my blood has eternal life and I will raise him at the last day. For my flesh is the true food and my blood is the true drink and everyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood is in me and I am in him. Even his disciples said, this is a very hard thing to understand. Who can tell what he means? Jesus knew within himself that his disciples were pl- complaining and they said to him, does this offend? He said to them, does this offend you? And at this point, many of his disciples turned away and deserted him. And then Jesus turned to the 12 and asked, are you going to? And Simon Peter replied, master, where are we going to go? You have the words of life and we believe them. And we know that you are the Holy son of God. And so pride is natural. You know, Pastor Greg and I were in a conference um, several years ago. It's probably been five plus years ago. And we were sitting in this service and it was it was kind of it was kind of heavy and it wasn't even um, so much doctrine, it was more preference. And um, man, we left and we were just like, man, you know, that was kind of harsh. And again, it wasn't doctrine as much as preference. And so we had a decision to make because it, I mean, it hit us hard and it wasn't doctrine, it was more preference. And we decided because we knew what the enemy was trying to do. He's trying to bring division between us and this gift. And we can't, so this is what we decided. You know what? If this is important to this, this leader in our life, that will now be important to us. We will make the change. Even though we didn't really see it and it wasn't that important to us, we just decided it's not worth it. We can make that change. And if, that, if that's the flow that he's in, then we're not willing to compromise everything that we have gained and all the progress that has made, we'll make the change. It's an easy change. It just seemed to be brought to our attention in a very adamant way. Well, over time, we realized because we didn't walk away. We didn't, if anything, we we went more aggressive in the pursuit of the gift that was in that person. We realized that even though it kind of hit us right between the eyes, he was addressing a bigger thing. It was so much bigger than just us. It was kind of the spirit behind a thing. But the reality is by making the shift, even kind of like, whatever, you know, like we'll do it even though we don't really see it. Oh, it helped us. It helped us so much. We weren't the same people for it. And, and we knew what the enemy was trying to do here because it, it was, it was something that was hard. Do you understand what I'm just like this? Like it was an absolute, let's put it that way because that's what eat of my flesh and drink of my, this is how I see it and you need to see it this way kind of thing. We hadn't seen it that way. And we went home, we kind of wrestled with it. You know, we went back to church the next night, you know, kind of almost black and blue a little bit, but we just decided, you know what? (laughs) Who are we? Who are we and who is he? Well, I want everything that the Father, I'm not gonna let anything. This is, even though it's a thing I didn't see, it's a thing I can change easily. And we'll make the switch. We'll make the switch. In 2 Corinthians, Paul experienced this in verse um, 11 through 18. Oh, my dear Corinthian friends, I have told you all my feelings. I love you with all my heart. Any coldness still between us is not because of any lack of love on my part, but because your love is too small and does not reach out and draw me in. I'm talking to you now as if you were truly my very own children. Open your hearts to us. Return our love. Don't be teamed with those who do not love the Lord. Lord, for what do people of God have in common with people of sin? How can light live with darkness? This whole idea that, that kind of doing things my way is going to be okay. That's natural. That's natural. Paul's saying you're picking this instead of this and it's not good. He's saying, what, why would you team up in this way? What union can there be with God's temple and idols? 
You are God's temple. Gosh, it's not natural. I mean, it's, it's natural to not acknowledge that. It's natural to not acknowledge that the Spirit of God lives on the inside of us, right? I will live in them, I will walk in them, they will be my God, and, and they shall be, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. That is what the Lord has said, leave them, separate yourselves from them, don't touch filthy things, and I will welcome you. You know, there shouldn't be filthy things operating in the lives of those who are, are sincerely following the Lord Jesus. Now in the local church, we're always gonna have, and we should, new people, baby people that are growing and learning and and walking away from addictions. But if you've been here for any length of time and you still tolerate filth, that's not okay. There's no excuse for that. That's rebellion. It's not stewarding reality correctly. What is reality? Reality is Christ in me and me in Him and accountability at the end of my life for how I live that way, right? It's, most people don't, most believers don't think like that. They don't think anything about doing things their way and still coming to church and thinking it's all gonna be okay. On Tuesday morning, the Holy Spirit awoken me early in the morning um, to, to, to discuss these kinds of things and, and, and we're gonna get into it because again, this, this goes back to progress with the blessing and go over Deuteronomy 28, see everything that's there. Go over Galatians chapter three, but let's look at a couple of more things that are natural Um, in Matthew chapter six. And let me see, I didn't number them, one, two, three. So I'm giving you basically four things, four things that are natural. We wanna defend against these. And so this would be number four. We'll look at two different um, translations or two different references here. In Matthew chapter six, verse 24, you cannot serve two masters, God and money, for you will hate the one and love the other or else the other way. So my counsel is this, don't worry about things, food, drink, and clothes, for you already have life in a body and they are far more important than what you eat and what you wear. And it goes on to say, and I don't have them typed out, let me pull it. Um, Verse 32, all these things, these day-to-day things, oh, let me back up to 31. Therefore, take no thought saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? Where shall we be closed? For all these things do the Gentiles seek. This is a natural order to be consumed with your day-to-day. This is what the Gentiles do. But your father knows that you have need of all of these things. So seek first the kingdom of God. The living Bible says in verse 34, live one day at a time. So, so an emphasis on the day to day, that's natural. That's gonna work against your progress in the blessing. What about in, in 1 Corinthians 7, 28 through 35? I use these verses a lot. They're so powerful to me from the Mirror Bible. It's certainly not wrong to get married. All I'm saying is that marriage brings extra challenges in already difficult times. The urgency of these times might demand mutual sacrifices from those who are married, such as sacrificing their time together for other priorities. Even our most personal space for grief or joy is invaded that leaves you with not time to indulge in your own interests and possessions. If you are in the process of buying something, buy it as if you'll never own it. Don't lean too hard upon the fragile economic structures of this world. They're here today and gone tomorrow. In my opinion, the unmarried person lives an uncomplicated life, fully devoted to the Lord without any distractions, while the married person is confronted with all the typical domestic challenges, absorbing his attention and his commitment to his wife, her delights and demands. The same goes for ladies. The unmarried woman can give her undivided attention to the Lord without any emotional or or marital obligations. I really have your focused devotion to the Lord. See, being spiritual, Cooperating with the blessing involves that we have this focused devotion to the Lord. And the reality is there's things in the natural that work against that. And so in order to be spiritual, I have to defend against those things. I have to understand those things and I have to count the cost. I really have a desire for you to live a beautiful life without any distractions that could possibly snare you. So strife is natural. Familiarity is natural. You know, I was even thinking about this. Pastor Nancy was talking with an individual one time and he walked up to her and said, you know, I don't really like women preachers. 
And she's like, well, I don't really like women preachers either. <laughs> I mean, what are you gonna say to that once you're a woman? Because the reality is like, it's not about male and female. It's not about male and female. You know, I remember Pastor Kathy telling me, uh, you know, about Catherine Kuhlman, um, an amazing healing evangelist of her time. She pleaded with the Lord, can you please call a man to do this? Can you please give this call to a man? Well, God didn't honor her wish. He didn't grant the, that prayer request, right? Because he's not looking at things like that. See, we can't allow ourselves to be familiar. We can't allow ourselves, you, you know, it's just like we're, we're having this, this conversation and, and, and all this stuff. And, and, I, and I think to myself, if not for that one man, I, my parents could be having this same situation. So Tuesday morning, the spirit of God wakes me up and says, how you treat your Abraham will determine your progress in the blessing. So we're gonna look at Abraham and Lot, how you treat your Abraham will determine your progress in the blessing. So Genesis chapter 13, if you wanna go there in your Bible and we'll end up there today, you're familiar with the story. So let's just um, open our hearts and our eyes to it. Um, open up our hearts. Working with the blessing obviously demands that we are spiritual. <laughs> well, we can't allow ourselves to be deceived. Right. Just come into, a lot of people come to church and they're not spiritual. Right. A lot of people read their Bible and they're not spiritual. Right. A lot of people pray a lot of prayers and they're not spiritual. In Genesis chapter 13, verse one, and Abraham went out of Egypt, he and his wife, all that he had and lot with him into the South. Abraham was very rich in cattle and silver and gold. And he went on his journey from the South to Bethel and to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and high unto the place of the altar, which he had make there at first. And Abraham called on the name of the Lord and lot also, which went with Abraham had flocks and herds and tents. And the land was not able to bear them that they might dwell together for their substance was great so that they could not dwell together. There was strife between the herdsmen of Abraham's cattle and the herdsmen of Lot and the Canaanite and the Perizzites um, also dwelled in the land in verse eight. And Abraham said to Lot, let there be no strife. I pray thee between me and thee and between my herdsmen and your herdmen for we're brethren is not the whole land before thee separate yourself. I pray thee from me. If you will take the land of the left and I'll go to the right. You notice he's taking the high road here. Um, if you'll take the left hand, then I'll go to the right. Or if you'll depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of the Jordan that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, and as thou comest unto Zor. Then Lot chose him all the plain of the Jordan and Lot journeyed east and they separated themselves one from another. Abraham dwelled in the land of Canaan, Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain. And this is the deal right here in verse 12, underline it, highlight in your Bible. He pitched his tent toward Sodom. He pitched his tent toward Sodom, Sodom's modern, modern day like Vegas. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. And the Lord said unto Abraham, after that lot was separated from him, lift up now your eyes. Look from the place where you are northward and southward, eastward and westward. Uh, Abraham goes on more and more blessed. He doesn't take a hit because lot walked away. He goes on bigger and better and better. But you can read for yourself in Genesis chapter 19, how it all unfolded for Lot, because ultimately he's just looking at Sodom, knows better than to jump all the way in. But it was only a matter of time that he moved into Sodom and Gomorrah, right? And what happened? He lost everything. He lost his wife, his daughters were married, but at one point he had given them up to the homosexuals in the community. Right? Angels had to literally deliver his family. His wife turns into a pillar of salt because she looks back. This is, this is like a family that was tied to the family of faith, like the original. We are still called the sons and daughters of Abraham. This is that guy. And, and I know, we know that when God spoke to Abraham, he told, he, Lot shouldn't have maybe been with him, but the reality is it really doesn't matter 
how you get associated. You know, when I look back over my life and I think about the voices and the men and women of God, you know, at, at the point where I'm connected with them, how I got there is really irrelevant. Because some of the people, I'm thinking about some individuals in my life that, that turned me on, so to speak, introduced some voices to me, they're not even in my life anymore. And I don't even think they still listen to those voices. So how I got attached to them, that's not even relevant. What's relevant is that once I discern that and I'm spiritual, Lot had nothing without his association with Abraham. And again, we're not putting people on a pedestal, but we're being spiritual. And we're understanding how intentional God is. And we're understanding how the blessing comes into our life. Because if you don't have that light, you know, the person that's texting me about, you know, the run on toilet paper and paper towel and all of this, you know, because I, I wouldn't know that. I've not been to the store, but, but, um, but I'm, I'm so grateful for the light that I have. Right? right? Well, that got there a certain way. Yeah, that's right. And it demands that I treat it a certain way. Yes, that's good. Right? And so Lot, Lot loses everything. Then, so sick and twisted, then, and, and this is kind of like, you know, then his daughters end up, end up sleeping with him, get him drunk and end up sleeping with him. I mean, this is just trash that goes on in this man's life. And maybe in his defense, he, well, Abraham should have told me, just deal with the strife. That wasn't Abraham's job to do that. It wasn't Abraham's job to tell him what to do. It was Lot's job to be spiritual, to prioritize, to determine what is most important here. Because as I'm wrestling like Tuesday morning, like Abraham and Lot, like, you know, and you, you know, like the Lord has to get my attention <laughs> again like <in> the morning, <laughs> you know what I mean? How you treat your Abraham is gonna determine how you relate. Because if you look at Galatians chapter three in the Amplified, just the, fir the first couple of verses, and, and we'll, we'll pray for today. Oh, you foolish and thoughtless and superficial Galatians. Isn't that natural? Yeah. So natural. Strife is superficial, shallow. Familiarity, it's shallow. Pride, you know, again, Greg and I are sitting in that service and we're thinking, oh, this is not good. Oh, you know, this is hard, right? But the reality is it really wasn't that hard. Yeah. It's not worth it. Yes. I pick them. Yeah. I pick the fruit in their life. Yes. Even if they're wrong, I'm going to be wrong with them. Yeah. If they're wrong on this, I'm going to be wrong with them. Right. Because there's, here, here's the thing. I know ministers. I know ministry leaders that, that stopped honoring this it doesn't go well they die <laughs> literally they die they die early they get divorced the, the things aren't there's no progress in the blessing because your associations are tied to that you need that light and you need it in every single season. And here's the thing, I want you to know about what, what, what the Spirit of God enabled us and helped us to do. We didn't just keep following this ministry and saying, well, we just don't agree on that. Because if I'm not gonna agree on that, the enemy's got an opportunity for me to be disagreeable on something else. I just said, listen, I'm gonna agree with that. I'm gonna agree with that. It's not even a deal as it pertains to what it would really cost me if I don't, if I allow familiarity in this relationship, right? And so he says, you foolish and superficial Galatians, who's bewitched you that you would act like this? To whom right before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified in the gospel message. This is all I want to ask of you. Did you receive the Holy Spirit as the result of obeying the requirements of the law? Or was it the result of hearing the message of salvation with faith, believing it? Are you so foolish and senseless having begun your new life by faith with the Spirit? Are you now being perfected and reaching spiritual maturity by the flesh? Read Galatians 3. I encourage you in several translations over the next several weeks. But the whole idea is if you got this spiritually, it's going to have to be sustained spiritually, which means you're going to have to be spiritual and you're going to have to fight against all of these things that may pull on you naturally because God wants you to, God wants to see you all the way. He wants to see you go all the way. 
but he is not in control of that. You're in control of that. And as we, we, we close today, I wanna to pull up one verse. I didn't put it in my notes. It's Romans chapter six. And um, this was from our, our Bible reading uh, yesterday. And I like the way that it was worded in the message. He's talking about our relationship with sin and all that we've been given in, in the power over it ultimately. Um, but verses 12 through 14, a variation of what we read here, that means you must not give sin a vote the way you conduct your lives. Don't give at the time of day. Don't even run little errands that are connected with that old way of life or just natural life, just natural life. And again, this doesn't have to be like, it doesn't always have to be pride. It doesn't always have to be familiarity. It doesn't always have to be strife. It can just be your day, your day, your plan, your idea of what life, you know, people get backed up with that. They get so constipated with their own needs, their own desires, their own plans that they cannot, I mean, there's no space for the plan of God. There's no, there's no space for the purposes of God. They're so consumed with the natural that when something comes up, they're spiritually weak. So they head right to the natural answer because that's their go-to because their whole world is that way, right? So these things don't have to be, uh, you know, the things that we identify with as major heart issues. But, but look, at, look at this attitude that I like so much. Um, throw yourselves wholeheartedly and full time into God's way of doing things. Throw yourself wholeheartedly and full time into God's way of doing things. So, so I'm looking at the blessing, but I'm looking at the associations and I'm making a decision that I'm not willing to walk away for something. I'm not willing to turn aside. I'm not willing to accept all that is available in this blessing, which is spiritual and powerful, but then try to work it out or grit it out naturally because it will not work. So Father, we